I'm pleased to welcome you here to this research exchange talk. My name is Camille Curtinden. I direct the Data and Democracy Initiative here at Citrus. And we're delighted to have Professor Peter Durr here to talk with us this afternoon. I have just a couple of announcements before I introduce Professor Durr. Um, we are pleased that you're here, and we're also pleased to have the online audience. These talks are broadcast by live webcast to the other Citrus campuses at Santa Cruz, Davis, and Merced. So we're pleased to have them join us, or it uh, could be webcast to your living room or office or anywhere you might be. At the end of uh, Professor Durr's talk, we'll have time for some question and answer, and we'll also be looking at the Twitter feed. So those of you who are participating remotely, if you would like to use the hashtag CitrusRE, we'll be taking a look at that and uh, be uh, happy to answer any questions that come across that channel. There is an I4 Energy talk this Friday here at noon, actually in this room, on downstream regulation of CO2 emissions in California's electricity sector. So if that's your interest, please tune in. Also, this afternoon uh, at 2 o'clock, between 2 and 4 o'clock, over at Blum Hall, there's going to be a poster session for all of the big ideas at Berkeley finalists in the area of uh, IT for society. So Citrus sponsors one of the categories of the big ideas at Berkeley competition. And there are nine finalists who will have their projects um, and posters over at Blum Hall this afternoon. They all look really intriguing and creative and innovative. So go and show your support for the students who did a lot of work on those ideas. And I think it'll be a really interesting event. One more thing, Cal Day is on April 20th. If that's not already on your calendar, take a look. Uh, Sutarja Dai Hall will be hosting a number of projects and activities. It's a huge day for all of campus, the big campus open house. So if you're here, stop by. There's going to be a lot of fun, exciting things going on. I'm pleased to welcome Professor Peter Durer uh, this afternoon. He's currently a visiting scholar with the Data and Democracy Initiative here at Citrus. His home affiliation is the Department of Social Sciences at the University of Applied Sciences in Munich in Germany, where he's a tenured professor of knowledge and communication management and head of the degree course of management of social innovation. Prior to his academic appointment, he was senior manager with the strategy consulting company Horvath & Partners served as Director of Research and Rapid Prototyping with the software startup Think Tools, and as a researcher in the Applied Science Division at Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory. So this isn't his first visit to Berkeley. He's well familiar with the Berkeley campus and Berkeley City, and so we're pleased to have him back. Dr. Dura earned his degrees at UC Irvine, another uh, UC affiliate in uh, economics, at MIT, and at the Technical University of Munich, a PhD in civil engineering. His research and teaching focuses on scientific methods of knowledge exploration and transfer. He's dedicated to working along disciplinary boundaries for finding solutions at the interface between society and technology. Please join me in welcoming Professor Peter Dorr. Thank you very much. Welcome everybody here. Um, when I came in September, I imagined I would stand here in April and present a little app that's completed to you. So I came with the idea to produce some software and be done by now. Of course I'm not. And I've uh, spoken to many people on my way who said, this is not going to work or you're not going to complete it in your lifetime. The problem is those are exactly the problems I'm interested in. So I will try to uh, give you an overview of what the basic idea is behind this tool, Exploring Political Controversy, and talk about my favorite theme, sense-making. Of course, all tools um, that are developed here are developed for sense-making. And I briefly want to introduce uh, some concepts of what I believe are necessary ingredients for sense-making. So um, I will spend about 20 minutes uh, talking about the big picture. What is actually the basic idea? And I can tell you I've been pregnant with this idea of empowering citizens for 10 years and I'm so happy I could come here and do something towards the objective of um, getting the citizen empowered. So I will spend some time uh, trying to give you an idea what I think has to change in order for citizens to be more powerful, to have a stronger voice in politics. And uh, then I will talk a little bit about the project, a little bit meaning uh, 15, 20 minutes, the reasoning explorer, 
and you see six visual icons which I will explain. They represent the six building blocks of the reasoning explorer. And finally, the last one minute, I will try to take you, if this thing works, and maybe some of you will walk out today and say this thing will never work. Um, be sure that won't discourage me, but um, if it works, I want, uh, will try to show you how that could change the way um, that people think about politics. So, I will start. What's the situation today? We have opinion overload. And we had a great talk of a uh, presidential candidate in Germany, Gesine Schwan, and she said, we have to start moving from opinions to arguments. Um, and she didn't copy that statement from me, and I didn't copy it from her. But we're very much confronted with the idea, this is what you have to do, this is what you have to do. There are no alternatives, a very famous German saying there are no alternatives in politics, no alternatives to anything, which is never true. The vision is the empowered citizen holding the crystal ball and trying to figure out for himself or herself what are the right answers to critical uh, world pressing problems in the world. And I have the idea that this crystal ball contains a tool set, a tool set of aids that will help us understand complex problems, where today we say, well, this is too complicated, let's delegate it to the experts. Citizens are stupid. I think that is not true. And there's a lot we can do and a lot that has been done to improve understanding of complex issues for normal people. How can we do that? We have an innate capability as human beings to make sense of things which don't make sense on first view. Namely, we look at patterns. If we look at any of these groups of things there, maybe that's a little culturally dependent, but most of us will try to make sense of or bringing in some order into this chaos. So we will look at this and say, well, I can organize the objects by color or shape or size. What a computer cannot do is take a quarter of a second to see which picture is contained on the right. We can immediately do that because we have a strong visual associative capability. We can look at different terms, and you will see two different kinds of uh, terms in here. Uh, we can look at these times and say, I can put them in an order of time. What came before what? As you know, Higgs boson was discovered after the end of the Roman Empire. And we can develop an order, a sequence in this. And in this case, um, hopefully none of you have experienced that, we can even show consequences of happening. So there's an inferential structure. Finally, there's a structure here that we can compare things, the shares of something compared to the shares of something else. So this is my first basic hypothesis, that these five methods of developing patterns, of making sense, um, are, a fundamental, uh, are fundamental basics of human sense making, referring to a special kind of inquiry. What is this part of? Is this American, Asian, European? Is this woman or man? Is this academic or real world? Uh, is this good or bad? Is this blue or red or gray? So this kind of categorization, actually, uh, that's a great uh, field of academic work, is to say you have this kind of depression and you have this kind of depression, because you scratch the back of your head and you scratch your knee. The second kind of sense-making is to find out whether things are similar. We just had the picture of the Mona Lisa, and we can say this part will be somewhere over there because it looks similar. A third kind, and that's what I'm going to be talking about today, is that we try to understand reasons for things or consequences, reasons and consequences. A fourth kind, what is next, bring things in uh, a sequential order. And finally, to look at differences between things on the scales, different size, different weight, different color. And we're very good at sense making using all of these tools. So there's the names, it's Categorial, Associative, Inferential, Procedural, and Comparative. Now, if you look at visualizations, I claim, and you will just have to uh, believe me for now, you can disagree when you ask your questions, that I believe we have tools out there that work fairly well at describing certain kinds of 
um, relationships, we have good tools to display categorical structures. You see here tree view displays. Um, this is, for instance, the, the hard disk of a computer can be decomposed into such a view. You have good tools to make comparisons. Obesity map of USA. Um, we actually just passed through a yellow zone, but apart from that, California is fairly green compared to the southeast. So a comparison, we have good tools. I claim we have good tools to display and analyze differences. Um, if you get to the procedural, it's harder to find good tools. This is a nice map showing uh, Napoleon's effort to go to Russia. And as you can see, a fundamental law about war is you come back with fewer people than you left with. The most interesting part of this slide is the lower right. I claim we do not have good tools to describe inferential relationships. Something, what is the consequence of? What is the reason for? But I do want to show you some tools that are out there, um, which are called argument tools. Some of you may know these kinds of notations, Wigmore notation and Toulmin notation. The lower right is a recent development um, in Klausthal in Germany called LASAD, learning to argue something. Um, and you can see this looks complicated. Right? This uh, looks complicated. So this is my starting point where I believe we have to make certain inventions to improve the um, comprehensibility of arguments. That's what we have today. You have an argument, I have an argument, and um, that's it. So let me try to summarize that in seven kinds of criticisms. One criticism, it's literal. If we have a debate and the arguments in debates, it's literal. That means it's text-based and text is big, right? So if you have a big debate, you have a lot of text and there's only two things you can do to solve that problem. You limit the amount of arguments that are included or you split it up into different debate spaces. The second problem, jargonistic. We as academics, of course, we use a certain kind of language so others cannot understand us. It's not by accident. It's, we work hard not to be comprehensible. It's worse in Germany than it is here. So we create a barrier in language. Doctors do it. Lawyers do it all the time. We don't want you to understand how simplistic our arguments, our own arguments are. The third problem is a lot of... Um, the arguments brought forth have no linkage between doing something and achieving something. It's just pieces of the argument that are displayed. A fourth, you can have similar arguments which stand as individual pieces of text and space and there's no mechanism by which we can uh, recognize that they're actually the same argument. A fifth criticism, it's pro or con. You're with us or you're against us. Um, but that's not the real world. We have different options. So the binary vision and all the argumentation software systems I showed you have that problem. Um, they're always green and red. A sixth um, criticism, and now it starts getting a little more esoteric, um, arguments are actually not hierarchical. They have what I call path adulteries. They're arguments that are the same at some points and different at other points. So the metaphor, the picture, the image of a tree is the completely wrong um, metaphor to use for arguments. Finally, now we look at the argument. So what can we do now? We can agree or disagree, um, but we can't interact with it. What we want to do is test it, see what's behind it. What if we change this? All the things we do when we have software systems and start playing with it. So what's the whole idea. It's crossing the chasm of the simple citizen and the expert. I excuse, if you personally know these people, I just got them from the internet. If you enter Google picture search experts, you actually get them. Um, and they do look like this. I mean, they weren't forced. So there's, you know, there's these experts. And actually, I learned a lot uh, about this going to the Bolt School of Law. And they have a lot of uh, interesting lectures there about um, deliberate democracy and what's the role of the expert versus the layman. Really interesting stuff. So how do we cross this chasm and saying, well, um, actually, 
how do we talk to each other? How do we empower people to become their own experts? So I have four specific objectives that I'm following. Um, not typical for me, but in this case, greater rationality. Um, I do think that in political discourse, there's an element of rationality. It's not huge. We'll get back to that. Um, but we can actually exchange rational aspects of arguments. Um, this is more my home. This is more fun. But I decided for one year in California, I'd go on the rational track. Second is we want to accelerate comprehension. I will get to the California Voter Guide in a minute um, from 2012. There's all this stuff out there. So if you want to learn something about high-speed rail in California, you've got to go through tons of documents. And you actually want the, the whole thing in a nutshell, right? Tell me the most important things in five minutes. And I did, who read through the entire voter guide? One, two, three. OK. Um, I'm allowed to vote here. I'm a dual citizen, so I read through it. But it's something I would only do when I'm on a sabbatical. Because otherwise, you don't have the time. The uh, California Voter Guide is 144 pages, 93,000 words. If you read 250 words per minute, it will take you one hour to read 15%. <laughs> so um, you can't read it. And after you've read it, uh, I ask you a question. So how about Proposition 32? What was the advantage of? You don't know. You've just read it. You haven't understood it. So by the time you're through, six hours if you're a good reader, and that's probably not true for all people living in California. So we have a problem here. It's the language and it's the volume problem. A third objective is, as I indicated before, you have an argument, you have an argument, you have an argument. They're not connected. I don't understand how it relates. What, is, what are the similarities? What are the contradictions in the different arguments? Everybody sort of carries their bag and their idea um, with themselves. And finally, and I'm not going to talk about this today, but it's a really important issue, scalable contestability. How do I know whether what you're arguing is true? Why do you think that if you increase wages, unemployment will increase? Why do you think that if you start doing education only online, people will stay at home and get fat? I would like to know not only what is the argument, I would also like to understand how firm is it? How well supported by evidence? And my brother works as a medical doctor. They have a system there of rating different kinds of studies supporting different kinds of uh, diagnosis and uh, medication. And you can say, well, that's super well supported, well supported, not so well supported. There's really an evidence support system. All right, that's the introduction. I promise 20 minutes. And now I want to talk specifically about what is the tool, the Visual Reasoning Explorer. And it has, as I indicated, different building blocks. The first building block is, OK, first pick an interesting debate. I think that's clearly understandable. Boring debates, nobody wants to understand the arguments because they're boring. We will get to the very difficult issue of extracting from text or spoken uh, information on the debate, extract the core arguments from that, then peel off the rhetoric right, and transform the uh, arguments, the written arguments, into causal influence diagram. The ID is, stands for influence diagram. So that's a bit a technical um, exercise. Take the individual arguments and integrate them into a systemic model, so not isolated arguments. Visualize the whole thing, and then try to um, turn it uh, into a tool that can be explored interactively. So it's not a static output. You say, uh-huh, uh-huh, interesting, nice debate space. I look at it from the east, from the south, from the west, and then I toss it. No, this should be an interactive process. So let's start with the relevant debate space. No, before that, I need to, I always show this slide in all my lectures. Um, because I try to explain why this project has no home in a specific academic field. And these are actually the different research areas that were involved in this 
project. And um, I like to display, you know, this is sort of the unknown out there, the things we don't understand. And as researchers, of course, we go into cozy little bays, the deeper the better, because if we can feel the confinement, then we can feel secure that we understand everything about our field. And hardly anyone really likes to go out there. It's cold, it's windy, and you're tiny, and everything is unknown. So when I came, I started, of course, social science department. I was interested, how does democratic involvement work? How do people actually form their opinions? Where does that come from? What are their ideas of well-being? What is the good? My uh, degree course is called Management of Social Innovation. So what is a social innovation? It has something to do with improving things. And improving means I have to understand what is good. I crossed the Atlantic. I thought, OK, now we build this tool. I will get three poor, overworked, never sleeping graduate students in computer science. And they will work day and night for me um, to construct this model. Think about how can the process be automated, what is the right representation, and then go over there and develop the right interfaces, visualizations, and so on. So it's an intuitive representation of a debate space. I quickly learned this is not enough. And um, I already indicated I went a lot to the Bolt School. And before that, I thought, OK, this whole logical thing, how an argument is represented, is actually not trivial. Causality is not trivial. And what happens if you start looking into something? You find 1,000 books on causal structures, on logical inference, and so on. And you kind of have to say, OK, I'll just go to the next bay, because this is very complicated. I did visit the departments that sort of dealt with language, both with the language we, we use to express our feelings and ideas, but also the whole uh, structure. Because if I want to take a text and extract arguments from it, and ideally have a machine do that for me, um, that's complicated, right? I mean, there's, there's people at IBM who've been working on that for a long time. And there's been tremendous advances, but it's very difficult to take a text and find the argument. Of course, you need to talk to the people who are in the business of putting out information and opinions. And I'm not talking about academics, because the world doesn't really care what we say. It's what journalists say, for instance. What they bring out, and they say, well, this and this has happened in Iraq or in the south of Austria. And there are certain techniques of how you can prove that that is true. And of course, all this is the basis of us forming opinions on specific issues. Finally, the politics its more where I started uh, with the policy analysis. I need use cases to look at specific debate spaces. So for five years in my class in, in Germany, I have students examine different policy areas. They pick them by themselves. Uh, this is an overview of all the topics that have been covered. And the exercise consists of doing the following. They're supposed to look into the political programs of the political parties, um, extract their positions on gender equality, on uh, foreign policy, on health or energy policy. That's fairly simple. And then they should try to extract from the political programs why are they saying that this is the right policy? Why are we supposed to do that? And that's the phase when uh, my um, office hours are very full. Because they tell me it's not in there. There are no arguments. Um, they just say this is what has to be done because it's good. So it's already very hard to find arguments in the political programs of political parties. And finally, they're supposed to derive from that what is it that they actually want? You know, freedom, justice, health, uh, jobs, all these things. This is the visual representation that they're using. And I'm just going to pass through that. Of course, when I came, I said, I cannot use a German use case when I'm in America. I need to pick up some topic that people are interested in here. Um, a student of mine actually said, I'm interested in this whole issue of nuclear pr proliferation, and especially the crisis or the difficulties in dealing with Iran. So uh, she's done some work on that. 
I had worked with an environmental agency on the California Water Tunnel Plan. Who knows about this plan in the room? Oh, not so many. Okay, so um, more water for Los Angeles. Um, in the end, I didn't cover that. And that's funny. I mean, only a foreigner could use the US presidential debate to look at arguments. <laughs> I saw, of course, the three debates, and I said, what the hell should I model here? There's nothing. There's just, you know. Finally, Proposition 30, and there was a project with the Data and Democracy Initiative, the uh, Proposition 30 Awareness Project. And um, I did some work on that because I found uh, that interesting and because it's part of the big voter guide. So how does that work? Extracting core arguments. I'm the first one to think about this issue. Um, the first thing to understand is an argument is many things, and Aristotle actually distinguishes between the, the logos, pathos, and ethos that are part of a good persuasion. Um, unfortunately, I'm only going to talk about the logos today because the pathos we all know. Um, there's also different, and this is again something I learned from uh, a visiting scholar at um, Stanford who uh, made me aware that there are these three different types of argumentation. There's the forensic, epideictic, and deliberative kinds of arguments uh, that are completely different in nature. We're just going to talk about the deliberative. So we're talking about policies and arguments you make about proposing things to do for the future. This is Proposition 30, the arguments in favor of Proposition 30. It's actually just one page. Then there's a rebuttal, and then it's the other way around. And if you look at this text, um, you can decompose what is said in there. I'm just going to show you one. So there's, after years of cuts, California's public schools, universities, and public safety services are at the breaking point. Can I validate that? Very difficult. What is a breaking point? Uh, so you see there's some text that just claims this is how it is. This is not an argument. It's an introduction to an argument. And then I'm sure you would come up with other interpretations, but we can go through a text and sort of try to understand what is the point that is made here. And if you go through the entire text, you will end up with a kind of classification. Again, I'm sure there are people who know much more about this than I do, but you can say there are only parts that claim a causality. What is the consequence? An argument that is actually portrayed. Some are normative claims like our children deserve better. Uh, we all agree and it's, you can't uh, validate whether that's true. Um, get California back on the track and so on. And a lot of things are just statements about status. So what I'm saying here, a, only a part of the text actually contain arguments. The most is other information. That is also maybe important, but if you focus just on the arguments, it's just the sections that are black in here. So what do we do? We take these argument pieces and we try to learn something from a representation from systems modeling. Um, I see there's some people old enough who know Forrester, who's done system dynamics modeling at MIT. I think there's systems modeling always has, is, is in fashion and then goes out of fashion again. But it's a representation of arguments or about changes in the environment that is a variable-based representation. So we don't work with entire text blocks, but we work with variables that can be more or less cardinal variables. So you can say, okay, if the wage level is higher, that increases staff costs. The blue arrow means the more the more, the red arrow the more the less. So these representations are already there, and we will use those to represent arguments. As I told you, if we think about causality in, in arguments, it's not a completely simple thing, because we can either see causality as a linear process, right? If I kick you in the foot, you will bleed, and you will go to the doctor, and you will call your lawyer. It's probably the first thing before you go to the doctor. Or you can see causality as a circular process. And I will try to explain in the next slide um, how do we actually see that both is true, that causality is linear and circular at the same time, by looking at how are policy proposals actually generated. If you propose a policy, 
it's because you think something is wrong. You perceive some kind of deficit, which means there's a difference between a desired and an actual state. Right? This is how it should be, this is how it is, so I need to change something. Now, in your head you have an impact model. You said, if you change this, then that will happen. Okay, so it's an assumption about causes and their consequences, about policies and their consequences. And if you execute the policy, it will change the actual state, it will remove the deficit, and everybody's happy. That's a basic, simple model of how to come up with policies. So far, so good, but it's a little more complicated because, um, first of all, the point of information and decision is prior to execution, so we only can formulate hypotheses about consequences. We can't prove that it's true. Right? We can't shoot missiles on Iran and then say, oh, actually it didn't work, undo. It doesn't work in the real world. So we have to take a decision based on um, things that we don't exactly know. We have a further problem, namely the value base that describes what is desired is invisible, as is the actual state. I don't know how many people live in the United States unless someone produces some evidence about it, some statistics department or something that counts them, right? So actual states of things we do not know, only what is published about it. That's very important to know because we always base our decision on produced evidence. And as we all know, what we produce as evidence depends very much on what we believe in. Remember the presidential debate? My study shows blah, 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 blah. Yeah, but my study shows that the more, and so on, everybody has their studies. And there's enough academics around who produce any kind of evidence you want if the money's there. Okay, let me just show the argument for me now is a representation that shows which means are um, used to achieve a certain ends. That's the argument. If you do this, in the consequence, you will have a desirable outcome. You will have removed a deficit and a representation that is then linear shows exactly that. It's means and ends. It's proposing a policy, changing the state, removing the deficit, and arriving in the Garden Eden. Everything is good. And in between, what you see as this pipe, that is the impact model. Okay? So we are claiming if you do this, you will get that. It's a causal chain. Oxygen would be great. And I'm late. What does the evidence have to do with it? The evidence is, well, it's not just an empty pipe. It's actually supported by studies, by experience from history. Experience from history is always interesting because everybody has a different experience from history. So, but there's something that supports it. If I say the best way to do a presentation is by turning around and you seeing my back, you know, I could test it. But if I just claim it, I could see whether more or less people or fewer people fall asleep. The transformation logic now is, you see here a sentence from a foreign affairs article, a military strike intended to destroy Iran's nuclear problem could spare the world a very real threat and dramatically improve the long-term national security of the United States. That is, that is a sentence from uh, Matthew Koenig in foreign affairs. And if you translate this text-based sentence into a model, it would be represented with four variables. A military strike reduces the nuclear pro uh, program, reduces the threat to the world, increases national security. That's a variable-based a variable based representation of the argument. So it's actually very simple from uh, systems modeling that you have a variable-based representation of sentences. What does that mean? as a consequence in terms of text volume reduction. My claim was if you use a different kind of representation, you can uh, increase the speed of comprehension. And now if you look at the text, only about a quarter is argumentation oriented, about 10% containing relevant arguments, and 3% of the text is required to have a variable based representation. So 97 or 96, 97% is the text volume reduction. I need to shorten things. I will shorten this. So we have different kinds of arguments. And I said before, the hierarchical tree representation is 
not the right model. What we have in debate spaces is a rhizomatic structure that connects all the things you can do with all the things you want. And there will be very different paths between the two worlds. The action universe, including everything you can do to achieve your ends, and the value universe that includes everything that for you is desirable. Let's look at Proposition 30 as one example. This doesn't look good, right? I mean, you can't read. Oh, this is your simplification. Thank you very much, Mr. Durr. Um, it's not a simplification, but if you look at what's actually contained in all the arguments that were brought forth for or against uh, Proposition 30, the main argument of the proponents was, well, let's uh, get uh, a tax increase for the rich and a short-term sales tax increase. We will have enough money to increase the uh, school budget to hire teachers to reduce class size with the assumption that that somehow improves education, right? So money, education for money, that's the proposal that was in there. Um, you see class sizes and get up-to-date textbooks and so on. What did the counter people say? <laughs> and that's actually interesting patterns. Oh, it's money for Sacramento politicians. That's actually always the main uh, in California, it's Sacramento politicians. On the federal level, it's Washington politicians. But there's all these people, these bad men who are uh, desiring to spend your tax money on useless things. So you, it will not lead to streamlining state-funded program. It will be f wasted on funded projects and so on. So they're not saying uh, that hiring teachers is not good for education. They're only saying the money won't be used for that. It will be wasted on other things. And then there was a lot of discussion about, well, their earmark, dedicated, and all the monitoring and controlling tools. So you can see there, it's not about different ideas of education. It's only about different ideas of funding mechanisms through taxes. And the, the big fear of, oh, taxes are bad or taxes are not so bad. I need to skip the other examples, of the airstrike on Iran. Uh, you could see the main arguments. If you have an airstrike, it will destroy the facilities and it will take them forever to complete the bomb. And others who say, well, if you uh, hit them, they will increase their efforts to complete the bomb. Right? And that's uh, some examples from Iraq where that happened. Or saying it will actually get sympathy from your neighbors and it will unify the people and they will allow you to spend more money on the military. Okay, I will come to the end because I do want to have, and I know this is a little bit overwhelming, not just to listen to, but also to say it all. Um, what are the ideas of how to improve the shitty visualizations you just had to look at so um, it is really better understandable? I said it's a rhizomatic structure, and I'm very convinced uh, that this is the right um, analogy of how you represent a debate space. So one early idea I had was the arguments are like rubber bands. The stronger an argument, the stronger it pulls between uh, the action and the outcome. And the more arguments you have along the objects, the stronger is the connection, the greater is the tension. That was the one analogy, um, but that's theory right now um, because we didn't build this model, so I can't show you and convince you. Another model was to think of a debate as this large water. You've learned by now I love uh, circular figures and water. And uh, that there's these arguments floating in the water, but only those which are supported by evidence really float. So the others drop down and good arguments are brought to the surface. Again, this is the theory. It needs to be programmed and uh, seen whether that actually works. Okay, some sketches I worked with the students from art practice who's also in computer science. We tried to design how does this whole space look and how do we interact. But uh, to all the professors who are working here, don't give them so much homework so they have more time for me. Um, there's a lot of examples out there, uh, all the, what the MDS, multidimensional scaling, the, the positioning of variables in space. It's all out there. Nobody has to program that. You just have to copy paste and take the existing algorithms, apply it to a debate space. Final point, and then it's your turn. Now we have the visualization. It's still very static, right? We can't really understand what's in there. How do we explore it? 
And the analogy I like to take is what we do, what our eye does to explore a picture. And you see here the, uh, the registered eye movements when a human looks at a picture. So we jump, we explore the uh, circumference, and we go back to places. And I very much like this analogy of how we explore something that is unknown. So we travel and we move back and we do these kinds of movements. That's what I would like to do uh, applied to a debate space, revisit different arguments, look at uh, different uh, kinds of evidence that is brought forth to support an argument. Okay, these are other examples just of how you do zooming in, path highlighting, and so on. I will not um, kill you with that and get to the end. Um, this is what we have today, of course. Um, we have someone who's an informant. We have a publisher or author who writes about uh, that. And as you can see, this is me. You can tell by the shirt. I'm now the translator, the poor guy who takes this text and tries to translate it into a different kind of representation that I hope is better understandable. And of course, that's very uh, stupid, this production process, because the publisher already goes through the task of translating things into words, and then I translate the words back into a variable-based model. So of course, the future um, should be that uh, this in-between person is not needed anymore. For instance, journalists producing arguments directly in the, uh, in the kind of representation that I try to show you. The second long-term objective is then, and I'm pretty sure this will come out, as you have specific rhetorical patterns that we use to convince other people. I recommend Schopenhauer, Aristic Dialectics, how to make sure you win the argument. Um, there will also be specific reasoning patterns that will be returning over and over again, uh, logical arguments that we use to convince other people. Thank you for your attention. I'm sorry I totally overwhelmed you. had too much material. Thanks for coming. Thanks so much. We'll go to questions. So this is a beautiful model for the argumentation that's really in some form already out there. What I'm really concerned with is the thing that's not out there. So for instance, in the big circle where you had, you know, of why you may send out a policy and what you hope to achieve, the biggest arrow was missing. The biggest arrow is, will making a proposal for a policy get me re-elected or not? Mm -hmm. right? And there's so much going on that is not, you know, really factual with the actual improvement you want to do, but how do I look? Will they be re-elected and the like? And unless we can really bring that into that model as well, the whole model is just kind of meddling with the surface, not with what's underneath. And of course, the other problem is in your last image, you're uh, eliminating the translator, but you still have the, the publisher in there. What if the publisher is a spin doctor? that gets very highly paid by some faction of society that have lots of money to pay a lot of spin doctors. And I think that's our problem. Mm -hmm. And unless we can really get all the way through and show those hidden connections and the real power struggle that comes from money, then um, it's not clear that we're improving the situation. So I think having the ordinary citizen understand the real thing is not the main problem. The main problem is we don't even have the, the value basis objectively enough. We can start building an argumentation on top of it. And in some instances, we're actually shielded from seeing the truth because it's much easier to you know, just say you're un-American or do something to deflect the argument in some way. How do we get around those much more insidious dangers to our democracy than lack of understanding? Good, that was a <laughs> Okay, um, of course you're right. And I mean, that's one of the arguments of the people who told me better stop today than tomorrow. Um, there are different aspects in, in, your, in your point. First of all, of course, the, pub the publisher is also translator, right? So um, you can't eliminate the translator. It's just, this is really just a technical idea of going from uh, information to a text-based representation, going from text-based representation to a model representation. And that, that is, you know, insane. Um, regarding the other point that you made, that this is scratching the surface, and how do we get to the relevant? I mean, I, I do understand what you're saying, um, that uh, the political discourse is highly irrational. That's, that's actually the point. Or it's very well um, 
manufactured um, by certain people, then rationality in there is irrelevant, right? And we could see, uh, that's the example of the presidential debate. Had any one of those two started making arguments, I mean, they would have lost, right? I mean, um, so the, you know that some newspapers, like the Washington Post, they have now these fact checker things. I'm not sure fact checking works very well because, I mean, they found out um, if, you, if you're factually wrong with your uh, assessment, it really doesn't disturb anyone. There's so many uh, people who say, well, maybe I'm wrong, but I'm still right. I mean, it's, it's so highly irrational. So from that point of view, I agree. Uh, this is futile. This is, this is on a different level. This, w this does not solve that problem of how you can buy... Uh, broadcast space, pretty much, right? And how you can uh, how you can make sure that something is under uh, that people will believe what you're saying. I can't solve it with that, but um, I think this is big enough uh, a problem that it would be good to at least have a rational basis. Not everything is so emotional and guided. I mean, uh, think about the uh, the shooting um, in in Newark. Uh, and, and the press release that came out from the NRA. And uh, I mean, it's just, oh my God, right? I mean, how are you going to solve that with, with a rational argument? You can't. You can't solve gun control law with rational arguments. I'm 100% sure about that. But there are other, other things. Uh, we have the Euro crisis in, in Germany, for, uh, in Europe. Um, and some other things where you say, I just need to understand what, what are actually the consequences. What happens if you do that? Oh, actually, we don't disagree on that, but we disagree on something else. So I do believe that in every conversation, there is also a rational part that we can refer to, apart from all the politics that's involved. So it's worth an effort. Yeah, I, yeah, I had a somewhat related question, which was the role of values in this sort of rhetorical um, inference. And they were there. I saw them a few times, but I, saw, I, I didn't see them as much as I expected to. I, I would have asserted that for the political debates, uh, it, it's not that there's a lack of, uh, of rhetorical argument, it's that the, 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 the argument is one step of a, of a chain of arguments that involve typically uh, strongly shared values across groups of um, voters, uh, a bunch of derivative um, uh, uh, beliefs that are very well shared and understood, and then there's like one step of an, of an inferential chain. But without those first two steps, the, none of those arguments have any meaning at all. But they, they have considerable weight because all of the voters, you know, conservative voters think government's too big, it wastes money, uh, you know, uh, other people think uh, conservatives are greedy and so on. There's all of that stuff. And there's a bunch of consequences from that. And I, it, it, your Prop 30 example, there was, there was actually shared um, value of schools. But that's actually, if you want to really make that argument, it's sort of been internalized by people, but it's a long rhetorical, a long I suppose, logical argument, or it's really a bit grounded in values ultimately. There's no objective reason public schools are good. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I would, well, I mean, versus private, so on, you know, it, it gets very complicated. It's not just a simple logical chain. So it seems to me a lot of this is going to be about trying to quantify and um, make concrete. And we, we did a little bit of political analysis. We can, you can measure some of these uh, latent values. and, and Anyway, so I, I think that's a critical part of this because the, the, I'm not sure that the actual topics of a lot of these debates, the presidential debates are a great example, has much self-contained um, lo logic rhetorical uh, uh, strength to it. Nevertheless, those debates and those discussions have great weight. And anyway, so I think that that latent stuff is very important, I think. Mm -hmm. I totally agree. This, uh, I did not talk enough about this part of the value system. But you could see um, in the Proposition 30 discussion, you could see some of these values actually emerge. You have the value. If you want to finance an education system, you need money, right? Nobody would disagree with that. Not even the people who think uh, the, the state is a bad thing. Nobody would disagree that good uh, education costs money. But you could see the fundamental difference in what it means to raise tax money, right? So for some people, taxes are just per se bad. That is part of their value system. And for others, taxes are there in order to warrant the financing. And I do think there is a level 
if you look, I mean, not for, uh, it's not by accident that this is a hierarchical structure. We're fairly sure about the, the extreme abstraction of what is the good. I don't think we have a lot of disagreement on what is happening here, right? I mean, we all want to be healthy and we want to be free and we want to, you won't find disagreement. You will have disagreement on what that means, the opera, opera, uh, operationalization of what is good. And that's actually one of the um, slides I skipped. There are all these different efforts that try to describe what does it mean to be a good society. Um, you know, of course, Bhutan has the, they actually measure happiness every year. And they have certain indicators that are uh, used for that. Um, the uh, Canadian Index of Well-Being establishes something about the healthiness of a society based on community indicators, how people are involved, etc. So I don't think it's, imp I completely share what you said and also what you said about that there's these very fundamental things, but I do think you can talk about it. You can talk about it. Why is it that you want to achieve this and not just stop with, well, I want jobs and I don't want to be, you know, uh, I don't want to have any danger from crazy people out there. I mean, read the NRA statement. They think the problem of, of guns is only computer games and uh, mentally, uh, people with mental disorder. Now try to def define who's supposed to be the one saying that you're mentally okay or not. I mean, in Germany, we have a very bad tradition on that, right? So, okay, I mean, I would define everybody as crazy who doesn't think like me. Actually, I, I do that. And you're right. <laughs> I think we'll have... Time for one more quick question, then we have to close. Um, in, some, in, in Europe, in some European countries, the pirate parties have suggested a system called liquid democracy. And they're, like, one of their core demands why they want to have liquid democracy is because they say uh, very often you have different parties who only um, suggest one package, but it would actually be a good idea to not to choose for either one of the packages, but instead have a combination of, of all the arguments and suggestions that, that the multiple parties suggest. So um, couldn't we have software by using your tools? Couldn't we have software listen to a debate, transcribe it, figure out the perfect consensus, then draft the perfect consensus bill, and then at the end we only need the parliament to kind of say yes or no to that perfect consensus? <laughs> That's, uh, thank you. So that's sort of the other end uh, between the, the pessimistic view that this is useless and that this will solve every problem. I think the reality is, is, is really in between. I mean, we do deal with, uh, we, we do deal with understanding complex problems with the help of some visualizing tools. Some things work very well. I showed this obesity map, right? Geographical information. You can immediately understand some things um, that you couldn't understand without the visualization. I think this will be an aid, but uh, I have to admit this is all in my imagination right now. Uh, it's not there. I don't know whether it's easy to use. We have to test it. If yes, um, I, I don't believe that you say, okay, uh, solve policy issue problem, okay, button on the side. I don't think that will exist, but it will help to sort of make out of a big conflict, I mean, we had several with uh, Stuttgart 21, the, the train station in Germany, where there's actually a lot of rational mass that you could sort of sort out of the political thing and say, okay, we're, we're clear on these issues, now we only have to have the political fight on the rest. I think it will simplify decision making because um, even with the person that's probably the furthest away from my view of the world, it's probably some you know, farmer in Iowa and me, if we got together, we could still find things that we agree on, and then it's, you don't always push everything in front of you, but you could reduce the amount of, of controversy. And I think that will really simplify things, and it will also give the citizen the feeling, say, oh, I sort of understand the Euro problem. I mean, wouldn't that be great? And on that note, we'll uh, conclude for today. Please join me in thanking Professor Peter Dorr. Thank you.